You've probably seen a few face tracking projects out there. Here are a few of my favorites. In 2017, Michael Reeves built a robot that would track his face and shoot a laser in his eye. Why? I'm not really sure, but it was pretty funny. A few years later, Scienceish built on that idea to shoot himself in the face with a Nerf gun. Then last year, Jay did something much less violent. He made an adorable shoulder-mounted companion bot named Asi that would track and watch other people. I helped him with some of the code, and I wanted to share it with you so you can make your own fun face-tracking robots. Most of the face-tracking cameras I've seen out there rely on the Raspberry Pi, which is great if you need speed. However, I'm going to show you how to do it with the OpenMV, which is smaller and requires less power. Let's jump in. There are a lot of pan tilt camera mount designs out there. You're welcome to buy or 3D print your own. I used this simple mini pan tilt design as a way to prototype this project. I drilled some holes to attach the OpenMV to the front. I found that I also needed to add some weights to the back to prevent it from moving. The tilt servo bolts in pretty easily, but the body of the mount just slides over the pan servo. To prevent it from falling off due to the weight of the OpenMV cam, I put some poster putty on top of the servo. You could also use some hot glue if you'd like to make things a little more permanent. We could use the OpenMV to drive the servo motors directly, but I found that this Micro Maestro board from Pololu is super helpful. It handles the servo pulses for me on up to six different channels. It also has some built-in features like the ability to accelerate, decelerate, and limit the speed of a servo's movement. With a little tweaking, we can get the servos to be a little more lifelike without the fast jerking motion that you often get with servos. All we need to do is send some serial commands to the Maestro board, give it a desired position for a servo, and it'll handle all that complex motion for us. I'm going to connect the TX and RX serial pins between the OpenMV and the Maestro. I'll put the tilt servo on channel 0 and the pan servo on channel 1. I'm going to connect a 5 volt external power supply to the servo power pins. I'm also going to connect a jumper wire from that 5 volts to the V-in pin on the Maestro board so that it powers the electronics. Then I'll connect the same 5 volts to the V-in pin on the OpenMV board along with a ground connection. Note that the OpenMV board can only take a maximum of 5 volts on the V-in pin, which means that if you're going to make this portable, you'll likely want to power the OpenMV and Maestro boards separately from the servos. That also helps keep noise out of the power lines to the electronics. For now, I'm going to plug a USB cable into the OpenMV so we can upload code to it and see what the camera sees. Don't worry, the USB voltage is not shorted to V-in. When you open up OpenMV, you'll see an example project, so let's delete that. We will import the board library as that will let us control things like pins and the serial port. Next we'll import sensor which will allow us to capture images from the camera sensor. Image allows us to manipulate any captured images and we will also import the time library which will allow us to measure things like frames per second and it also gives us access to things like delays. LED 3 is the blue LED that's on board the OpenMV camera. We're going to use this to light up whenever the camera sees a face. That'll give us immediate feedback when we're looking at the camera. OpenMV has us configure the camera before we can use it. I'm going to use some of the default settings found in those example projects to set the contrast and the gain. These should work well enough for now. Feel free to play around with these settings. I'm also going to set the frame capture size to QVGA, which is 320 by 240 pixels. And I'm going to capture in grayscale. To find faces, we don't need color. It might help, but by going to grayscale, it will save us some computation power and QVGA is part of the sensor library or package, so we need to use sensor.qvga. The idea is whenever we find a face, 
we want to see where that face is, the center of that face, in relation to the center of our camera's captured image. So we need to find what the center of our frame is, and to do that we can call sensor.width and sensor.height to get those dimensions, which should be 320 and 240. Then we're going to divide those by 2, and we're going to add 0.5 and convert it to an integer so that we can have an integer value that's the center x and center y. If they're even values, this is going to be rounded up, which is good enough for our purposes. We're going to start our clock here. That will allow us to compute the frames per second so we can see how fast this thing is operating. HAR features are essentially predetermined filters that scan across and down an image to look for certain features that create a face, and these filters have known values to find the features that are in faces. A cascade is when you stack these features end to end and you create a number of stages that these computations go through. The maximum we're allowed is 25, that increases the computation time, but I'm going for accuracy here and you can always decrease the number of stages if you want to have this perform more quickly, but you lose some accuracy. So let's go with this stages equals 25 uh, for our HAR cascade filter that will find faces in the image. Then we create our super loop. At the beginning of the super loop, we're going to take a timestamp that's going to be used for calculating the frames per second. We're going to capture an image from our camera and store it in this IMG variable. For each image that we capture from the camera, we're going to call this find features function and we're going to pass it that face cascade. It's the har cascade feature detection object that we created before the super loop. We're going to set the threshold to 0.75. That tells the feature detector that in order for it to positively identify an area as a face, it must have at least 75% probability that it thinks it's a face. We'll set the scale factor. I'm not super sure what the scale factor does, but I believe it makes the HAR filters a little bit bigger so that it runs faster on the image, but it's going to be a little less accurate, especially for smaller faces. So it will run faster with slightly less accuracy. and. According to the docs, you want to set this higher than 1, and they recommend something between 1.35 and 1.5. The example given in OpenMV is 1.25, so I'm going to start there, but feel free to play around with this value. When that find features function returns, it's going to give us a bunch of objects, a list of objects. These objects are going to be bounding boxes around any of the faces that it finds in the image. And what we want to do is find the largest face in the image. Ideally, this is the closest face, and that's the one we want our pan tilt camera to look at, but it could be the largest, whatever that happens to be. To do that, we're going to initially set our face size and largest face bounding box to zero and none, and then we're going to loop through all those objects, and if it finds anything, the largest face size will be set, and that's the bounding box that gets kept. For each object that's in this list, we get the bounding box x, y coordinates, which is the top left of the box, and then the width and height of the box. So elements at index 2 and 3 are the width and the height, so if we multiply those, we get the area of that particular bounding box. So we're going to calculate the face size, at least according to this bounding box. We're then going to see if this calculated face size is larger than the largest face size. If it is, that becomes our new largest face size bounding box that we will remember. If there are no faces, then the largest face size is just default zero and there's no bounding box. It's just set to none. Lucky for us, OpenMV has a number of draw functions where it will draw objects or things like rectangles, circles, dots, lines in our frame buffer window over here so we can get an idea of what's going on. So we're just going to draw a rectangle that has the same dimensions, the x, y, width, and height of any given bounding box that we find. That will allow us to see what faces are seen by the camera. If there's no face, then we don't want to do anything. However, if there is one or more faces that are found by the camera, for now, let's draw a line from the center of that bounding box to the center of the frame. 
And when we go to move the servos, we will want the servos to essentially move along that line so that the bounding box, the center of the bounding box, lines up with the center of the frame. Before we do that, let's turn on the LED. That's going to be the blue onboard LED to let us know that one or more faces were seen. We'll also print out the bounding box info to the console so that we get an idea of those X, Y coordinates that we will need. Then we need to calculate the X and Y coordinates of the center of the largest frame in the image. That's from our largest face bounding box. Remember the zero element is X and the two element is the width. So we can compute half the width plus 0.5 so that we can round up when we convert it to an integer. We add that to the X and that should give us the center at least in the X direction of our bounding box. And we can do the same thing with the height so that we can compute halfway down the height of the bounding box, round that to the nearest integer, and we will add that to the top left Y coordinate. So now we have the X and the Y of the biggest bounding box. Finally, with all that information, we can draw a line from the center of our frame, given the X and Y, to the X and Y, which is the center of the bounding box. If no face is found, essentially this largest face BB is set to none, no faces were found when we run that filter, this if does not execute, so we end up down here. The only thing we want to do is turn off that status LED. So the LED is only on when there's a face in the frame and the camera sees it. We can call the built-in clock.fps function to print the frames per second to the serial terminal just so we get an idea of how fast this thing is running. Anything over, I don't know, 5 to 10 frames per second, I'm pretty happy with. That means this thing will run hopefully fairly smoothly. And this is not taking into account any servo controls right now. Let's just see if we can capture faces. I'm going to make sure that my OpenMV camera is plugged into my USB port. I'm going to click this button down here on OpenMV. That should connect with this symbol, and then we're going to run this. And I need to correct a spelling error here. Make sure it is not none instead of note. And let's try running again. And here we are. We'll wave at the camera. I'm going to make this bigger by dropping down this divider. And hopefully when I look at the camera, it sees my face. And as I move around, you can see the bounding box move. And you can see there's a line being drawn to the center of the frame. And in the next step, we're going to take that information and we're going to move the servos such that the camera tries to line up this center of the frame with the center of the bounding box that's being computed wherever I move my face. Now, let's open the serial terminal. And you can see I'm running about 11 frames per second. That will slow down with servo control. But every time it sees a face, you can get that bounding box information. So you've got the x, y coordinates for the upper left of the bounding box and you've got the width and the height. So that's how we use OpenMV to find faces, and we're going to use this information to move the camera to line up the face with the center of the frame. And you can push the X in the bottom left to stop running the script. At this point, we've used the OpenMV to detect faces and figured out how we might want to move some servos, but instead of using the OpenMV to control servos directly, I'm going to be using the Micro Maestro board. Any of these Maestro boards should work, but the Micro is good enough for our needs. We can talk to this Maestro board by using some serial commands. If you go to the pololu.com documentation for these boards, you'll see 5B is the TTL serial, which is what we need. There is a PC software called the Command Center, I believe that's the name from Pololu, that will allow you to talk to the Maestro board over USB, and you can use that to set things like the device number, the baud rate, and so forth. Without using that out of the box, we can still talk to the Maestro board over TTL serial, but it's going to use AutoBaud, where it tries to detect the baud rate itself, and 
To do that, we need to use a certain command protocol. We're not going to be using the compact protocol. If you set the baud rate to be something static, like 9600, then you can use this compact protocol. But without it, we have to use the full Pololu protocol, where we send hex AA first, and I'm going to do this every single transmission message I send from the OpenMV to the Maestro board, and the Maestro board will use this hex AA to detect the baud rate. We then send the device number of the Maestro board. By default, this is 12. And then we send our command and then whatever payload we want. The only thing we care about right now is the set target. That says to set a particular servo on our particular channel to a target pulse width. And you can see how that's constructed here. So hex AA is that auto baud detection. Device number, this should be 12. The command is hex 04. The channel number, this should be 0 or 1, depending on if we want pan or tilt. Then we have the low bits and the high bits for the last two bytes. Keep in mind that most servos are between 1000 and 2000 microsecond pulse widths. So 1500 should be ideally right in the middle. That's for a 180 degree servo, that should be 90 degrees. We're going to use this information and we're going to construct these commands manually and send them to the Maestro board so that the Maestro board can control the servos for us. And it takes that load off the OpenMV so it can concentrate on doing things like face detection. Let's go back to OpenMV and we're going to scroll up. And you can see where I've got a picture of myself here, so we'll use that as reference. The pan servo is connected to channel 1 on the Maestro board, so we'll need to remember that. I'm going to set this arbitrary pan speed, and this is based on some trial and error. If we look at the line that's drawn from the center of the frame to the center of the bounding box on any given face, we can calculate the X number of pixels and the Y number of pixels. We're going to use that kind of as an initial way to say, let's move the servo by some amount in the x direction, and then move the tilt servo some amount in the y direction. You could do a bunch of math to figure out the exact degrees that the servo needs to move in order to make this line up, but you're probably going to need some more information like the distance from the camera to the face, how big the face is, and so forth in order to really calculate that information. Rather than do all of that, we're going to kind of do this empirically and just guess that uh, I think I need to move over X number of degrees and up number of degrees based on kind of this line, the number of pixels in this line. And this is very much trial and error. I'm going to multiply that amount by this speed multiplier. If it's one, it's basically going to just add the number of pixels to the in that particular direction, and same thing for the Y direction. If it's less than one, it's gonna move a little less and hopefully undershoot. And if it's more than one, the servo is going to move more than this line. In theory, we'll see how this actually works. Like I, like I said, this is a lot of trial and error. What I find is that you wanna undershoot moving the camera to line up with the center of the bounding box a little bit because you'd rather go one more iteration as it moves towards its destination. If you overshoot, what you're going to find is that the camera will move past the face, come back, and it will bounce back and forth. It will oscillate in order to settle on the face, or you might overshoot by a ton. So adjusting this speed multiplier is necessary to get a smoother motion. Or like I mentioned, you could try to figure out the exact angle and move the servo by that amount, but let's go with some trial and error at first here. I will leave those calculations up to you if you want to be more exact in your motion. We're going to bound the servo here to be between 1000 and 2000 microseconds in its pulse. This is just a safety check so that we don't try to tell the servo to move beyond its bounds. We're going to do the same thing for the tilt servo this time, just change the channel to zero, and we're going to keep all of these settings separate from the pan servo settings, even if they are the same values. This way you can, say, play with the speed of the tilt separately from the speed of the pan servo. The threshold X and threshold Y values create a dead zone for us. 
In this case, we're gonna say that we're trying to aim for the center of the bounding box to be within 20 pixels in the X or Y direction of the center of the frame. If it's outside of that, the servos are going to move to try to match the center of the frame to the center of the bounding box. If the center of the bounding box is within 20 pixels of the center of the frame, then the servos won't move. And we're gonna call it good enough that the camera has faced the face that it's trying to find. This creates a dead zone. If the dead zone is too small, what you're gonna find is that the camera is likely going to oscillate back and forth trying to perfectly align the face in the center of the frame. If it's too big, you're gonna find that the camera won't move at all because it thinks everything is good enough. So feel free to play with these numbers. I find that 20 in the X and 20 in the Y is a pretty good start. Changing the direction of the X and Y motion, so your pan and your tilt, I'm gonna allow those to be one and negative one. We're gonna use these values to multiply by the movement value we calculate later so that you can flip the servos depending on how your particular pan tilt mount is configured and you would just need to change one to negative one or negative one to one so that you can flip the direction of the servos as needed. The OpenMV has a number of UART channels the pins that we're using are connected to UART channel one, and we've connected those to the Micro Maestro board, so we need to set that we're using UART channel one in the OpenMV. Our particular Maestro board is the Micro Maestro, which has only six channels available for us to connect servos, so I'm just going to make sure that we limit that in our code. While the Maestro board does use AutoBaud to detect the baud rate, I'm gonna set our baud rate to something fairly low, like 9600. Feel free to play with this if you'd like to try sending commands to the Maestro board a little bit more quickly. As we saw earlier in the documentation, we need to send that initial hex AA out so that the Maestro board can detect the baud rate. The Maestro device number is 12. If you change the device number using that PC software, then you will probably have to update this device number. But out of the box, the Maestro board should default to device number 12. The only command we're going to support right now is hex 04, which is that command to set target of a particular servo. Next, I'm going to divide off my functions so that this code is a little easier to read. Feel free to create libraries out of this, but I'm putting everything in one script just so you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. The first function we're going to create is this generic servo send command. This is going to construct a generic Pololu protocol command to send to the servo controller. And what we want to do is make sure that the channel that we're trying to talk to is in range of our particular maestro board. Then we're going to construct our message as a byte array where we just kind of stack everything together. If you look back here, you can see an example of how they construct it using C. We're going to do the same thing in Python. Note that they mask the target, the payload here, with hex 7f as this contains the lower seven bits of the target. And in this case, we're using the set target, so that's what we care about. You can see how that calculation is done right here. Then we need to get bits 7 through 13 of that target. Then we're going to right shift the target by 7 bits and also mask that with hex 7f. And we're just doing that right here when we construct the payload. But everything else should line up where we use the hex AA, the device number, which is 12. The command, in this case, is hex 04. The channel, which is going to be either 0 or 1, that should not be less than 0 or, in this case, equal to or greater than 6. And then we put together that payload. And for our script, UART's going to be a global object, so we can just call UART.write and send this constructed message. Next, we're going to create a wrapper function that will call this send command, but specifically for set target. Even though pulse is given in microseconds, we have to multiply this by four to get the payload that we're going to send to that particular channel. You can find this in the documentation, which is given here. So if we want to set a servo to 1500 microseconds, we have to multiply it by four in order to get a value and that becomes the payload. And all we're gonna do is call this function that we created earlier 
use the command set target, which is this hex 04, the given channel number, and this PNUM that we calculated. Next, I'm going to divide off my main right here. So you can see my functions. So up top, we have our settings, then we got functions, and we've got our main where ideally execution begins. We start off by configuring the camera, getting the X and Y. After that, we want to set up our serial port that talks to the maestro board. Our code's going to remember the X and Y positions of the servos, and we want to set initial positions, and we're going to do that by calculating what should be the halfway point for each of the servos. Once we have the information that we need for finding the largest face, we're going to move the servos. Using this face X and face Y, which should be the center of the bounding box for the largest face, we're going to figure out how far away from the center of the frame that center of the bounding box is. And we're just going to use simple subtraction to do that. And we note that if it's inside the threshold, which is our dead zone, then we're going to say the difference is going to be zero, which means don't move the camera because the face is close enough to the center. Here's where we calculate a speed, or how much we want to move, rather, that we're going to add to the servo positions. In this case, the deer is either 1 or negative 1, based on how we've mounted the servo in the pan tilt mount. We have the speed, which is 0.8 in our case, and that will help us determine undershoot or overshoot, and this difference in pixels that were calculated above. We're going to take this difference that we calculated here, and we're going to add it to the current position. For both pan and tilt, we're going to make sure that the calculated values are constrained between 1000 and 2000 to make sure that we don't try to move the servo beyond its bounds. You can also use these values where I've set 1000 and 2000 to constrain the motion of the servos based on your particular pan and tilt mount. So for example, if your mount doesn't allow a servo to go, say, below 90 degrees looking down, say it's only looking up or straight ahead, you can actually change this to, say, um, 1500 or 1000 to 1500. That'll constrain it within 90 degrees of motion, assuming you're using a 180 degree servo. But for now, we'll allow full range of motion. If I break something, well, I break something. But know that you can constrain your servo motion here if you're, say, putting your pan tilt inside of a robot case and it can't move beyond 40 degrees or whatever it might be. And lastly, we send those commands off to the servo controller to move the servos. First, I'm going to turn on my servos. I'm going to give it the 5 volts so that the servos can move around. Then I'm going to connect my OpenMV board. And let's run it. Looks like I've got an error here, pulse tilt min. There's no pulse tilt min because I missed because I misspelled this. Let's try this again. There we go. And the servo moves around. If you find that the servo is a little too jerky, we're going to correct that in just a second because servos are generally fairly jerky. If you find that it's overshooting and oscillating, you'll want to correct that servo pan speed and servo tilt speed numbers. And same thing if you find that it's undershooting and taking a while to catch up to you. But feel free to move around and play with it. And we have basic code right now for tracking a face. It tracks my face decently, but I find that the motion is a little too jerky. To correct some of that jerkiness in the servos, we can rely on the Maestro board to handle a nice acceleration, deceleration, and we can limit the speed so that the Maestro board handles setting the servos in such a way that the motion is smoother or more natural rather than us trying to do all that math ourselves in the OpenMV. This is the advantage of the set speed and set acceleration commands that we just send once to the maestro board and the maestro board 
handles it for us. It limits that speed and acceleration slash deceleration of those servos. Note that we need hex 07 and hex 09 in order to do that, so we're just going to create a couple of functions to handle both of these commands for us. Let's head back to our code. And we're going to create a few other settings. The speed limit number is given in units of 0.25 microseconds divided by 10 milliseconds, whatever that comes out to be. But I have found setting this to about 15 gives us a more natural look to the servo motion. Once again, feel free to raise the speed limit. Note that if you set it to zero, it removes the speed limit so that the servos go as fast as they can possibly go. The same thing is true with the acceleration limit. Once again, I'm going to set it to 15. Feel free to play with this number. The speed and acceleration also have limits according to the Pololu docs, so we're just going to limit them in our code here. We're going to support the set speed and set acceleration commands, so we're going to define those command bytes here, and let's create a couple of new functions. We'll clamp the desired speed to the given min and max that we set up in our settings, and we'll send that command off to the servo controller with our given speed. We're going to do the same thing with the acceleration limit, where we can call this particular function to set the acceleration limit, and that acceleration value is bounded between the given minimum and maximum that we set in our settings. Prior to running our main loop, we're going to set the speed limits on both channels, the pan and the tilt channel of our servos. Note that we're doing this outside of the main loop because we only have to call it once the maestro board will remember those speed limits that we have set. If you try to run other code and use that maestro board, don't forget to reset or change the speed limits, otherwise you might find that the servos are moving faster or slower than you intended. We're going to do the same thing with the acceleration limit. Note that we're using the same speed and acceleration settings for both pan and tilt channels. Once again, feel free to change and play with that if you want to have different left-right motion versus up-down. This should be all we need. Make sure that your servo controller is getting power so that it's powering the servos. Make sure that your OpenMV camera is connected and let's run this. And sure enough, it can track my face, and you'll notice that the motion should be a little bit more smooth this time. I'm going to move around and see how well it tracks me here. I'm pretty happy with this motion. It could use a little tweaking, but it's pretty good. If we stop it, you can take a look. We're getting close to 8 frames a second here, which is a little bit under that 10 frames a second that I really like to aim for, but I'm pretty happy with the way this came out, and considering we don't need to use a Raspberry Pi, that's pretty good. When you're ready to run your program on the OpenMV when it's not connected through USB, first make sure it is connected through USB, Go to Tools and select Save Open Script to OpenMV Cam as main.py. That will save it on the device itself, so you can run it on the OpenMV board without being connected to your computer. Once you're done debugging, you can remove the USB cable. The 5 volt benchtop power supply that I'm using is enough to power both boards and both servos. As I mentioned earlier, for a real deployment, you'd probably want to power the servos with a battery or power supply that's separate from the OpenMV and Maestro Electronics power supply. I put a camera behind the project so you can get an idea of how well it tracks my face. You can see that the motion is fairly smooth, however if I move too quickly or if I move too far away, it's going to struggle to keep track of me. That being said, I know that I could increase the resolution beyond 320 by 240. That would hopefully make things more accurate, but it means I would likely lose out on speed or frames per second. Feel free to play around with the settings to get something that works for you. If you make a cool face tracking project, let us know in the comments or tag us on Twitter. Happy hacking!